Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 4, 2021. Happy 4th of July to those who celebrate the 4th of July. Are the first reading, thematic reading, Ezekiel chapter 2, 1 through 5, the semi continuous first reading, 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5, and then 9 through 10, Psalm 123, all of Psalm 123. This second reading is 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 10, and Mark 6, 1 through 13. Any 4th of July plans? Hello, Sermon Brain Waivers. Just listen to a good sermon on Mark. That's all I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Well, it depends on obviously the weather and family, but you know, usually the highlight is being at uh, Mule Lake for the boat parade. A lot of the, a lot of the lakes okay. in Minnesota, they'll have boat parades, and our family has a spot on Mule Lake, and so. Uh, one of the oldest guys in the lake always leads it with uh, an, a mule uh, uh, that uh, he got off an old uh, uh, merry-go-round. Not, not what, what's the one at the fair? Carousel. Called? Carousel. He's got the, that mounted on the front of his fishing boat, so he leads it with the mule. That's that what I'm sounds, doing. That sounds great. It's charming in its uh, low uh, low bar. If, you know. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, happy Fourth of July! Uh, and, but we do for have, those for our listeners who are our in listeners the United are, States. For the yes. rest of you, sorry, just ignore all that part. It's our Independence Day. And here's a passage about going back to your hometown and getting together with family. Actually, we for Fourth of July, pe uh, people in the United States could preach on the Ezekiel lesson. I'm sending you to a nation of rebels. There you go. No, okay. Look, yeah, hometown. Let's talk about hometown. Is this the part where they throw him off the Mount of Precipitation? That's no, in the that's Luke in, in parallel. That's in Luke. I just wanted to say Mount of Precipitation. All right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go very well. No, this is where uh, the, 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 the neighborhood isn't impressed. I mean, they, there's this odd switch, right? Where, do they, where did he get all this? What's this wisdom? What deeds of power? So there's some kind of amazement. But then the switch in verse three, right? This is the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James. And no mention of the father, which is interesting. It, it could refer to uh, the fact that maybe Joseph is dead by this point in time. It could be an implication that, that there were rumors that Jesus was not really Joseph's son. And, and so that it, there could be a kind of diminishment of him taking place there. Uh, and then Jesus response, right? This is what happens to prophets. He doesn't appear to be eager to give them a second chance or explain things or, or have dialogue. But so there's rejection, but then I think it's really important to notice it's followed by initiative, you know? So there's rejection at home and his response is- I'm gonna send my disciples send out. Send people out. And yeah. so I think you wanna read those in, in, in tandem. Yeah, I, I think so too. And maybe to go back, uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the questions in Mark or Rolf brought that up. Uh, who is this that the wind and the sea obey him? And he, where did this man get all this? I mean, that's, uh, uh, there's a, just so much in that, you know, where did this man, uh, the irony in that of, of, well, really who is Jesus? And get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? So there's that, that, so what you get there are questions, theological questions, like is that, of course, the reality is this is God, uh, but not necessarily recognizing that that's what they're asking or what deeds of power are being done by his hands. And so that this question of identity, this question of Jesus' authority, once again, um, on, the, on the lips of, of the townspeople, and uh, and so the again those questions I think are important. Could dwell on those. 
Yeah, it's a question about who is he. And again, it's, you know, those closest to him should know. We saw his family didn't fare so well back in chapter three in terms of knowing who he was. But it's also, I think, a, a story about the ministry mm -hmm. in that the people that he called also back in chapter three to be with him are people that he gave authority to back then. And now he sends them out. In other words, the, the disciples have received the same ministry that he has or he shares that same ministry. They don't invent their own. And so there's this sense of he might be rejected, but this thing is going to continue through other means. Right? There's going to be other, what's the word I want? Kind of spokes heading out from the hub or something like that, which so as, as tragic as the hometown rejection is, it appears to have very little impact on slowing this mission down. The, and the mission of course is the announcing of the arrival of the kingdom of God. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yet there's not a, there's not a, there's not, of course, a fulfillment of that or completion of that because the disciples, they go out and they proclaim all should repent. So like the first part of Jesus opening sermon in Mark 1 14, but then they don't say repent. they say repent, but then you don't have the follow-up and believe in the good news which is lacking um, in, in what's narrated in this, right? So it's, um, I find that to, what, you don't think that's true? I think it's interesting that that piece of, uh, that piece of Jesus opening message, right? Which we talked about before of 1, 14 to 15 is not directly stated. And so what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that, um, they themselves can't quite say that yet, or Jesus didn't doesn't direct them to do that, or it just sh shows sort of the penultimate reality of the kingdom of God, or I just find that absence lacking. I mean, absence interested, that omission interesting. Yeah, I've never thought about that before. Like, is there something here that suggests they're not doing the whole work? In three, there, we're told that he sends them out to proclaim to proclaim the message, it's probably just you and Galizzo. I'd have to look that up. Um, there's, there's also the question of when Jesus says in Mark 1, repent and believe, are those basically synonyms? I mean, we think about them as differently. Mm -hmm. I think repent is about, I don't think repent is, I think re, we've talked about this, right? Oh, that yeah. repentance yeah. is right. taking on a new point of view and believe is more than just cognitive right, right? It's, right so it's active so yeah or i think trust. We're, splitting, we're probably splitting hairs here exactly yeah well if, especially but if you think of it as trust you know repent that is see things differently and trust that the god that you know that the presence of god is here um maybe there is something to the fact that there that that trust is not quite present yet i don't want to make i don't want to make more of the omission than than it needs to be but i but to what extent narratively uh it it's still it there's this there's this um invitation or this this recognition that uh that we're still not there yet um that there's still that that trust that the kingdom of God truly is here uh, in Jesus is has not come to a fulfillment yet. But that doesn't necessarily. But that doesn't prevent though the sending. It, um, it by the way in Mark three it's just Caruso or Caruso. It it so it's just to proclaim and it doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't have an object to it. Um, there's so many things about this passage which have tantalized people. One, uh, you, you've already um, touched on one, which is, you know, uh, why is it that they wonder where he got all this? Uh, where has Jesus been from age uh, 12? I realize that's Luke. Uh, you know, it's the missing years. And then so go listen to John Prine's song, Jesus, the missing years. Uh, which is actually a pretty good song, actually, by the way. But uh, and then why can't he do, you know, it says because of the lack of faith, he, he couldn't do any due to power except, you know, cure a few sick people. Uh, but the part that I'm most interested in this story is the same part, really, I like the way Matt put it, which is um, he shares his ministry with the disciples by sending them out. And then you get, I mean, I, I like the Luke inversion because it's longer and more filled. Uh, 
but what you get in Mark 7 is still the same thing. Send them out two by two, gave them authority, um, but he ordered them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money, um, but to wear sandals, but not two tunics. Um, the, uh, and what's compelling to me about this, and I know I've talked about this, this a lot over the last few years, is for the, for the church to, to relearn uh, the ability to be the, to, the, to be the guests of other people's hospitality. I think it's, that's an essential missional uh, behavior that we've lost uh, a lot of the ability to do. Um, and if we are to learn to make disciples of, of what's a, a, a growing largely now secular post-Christian society where we live, um, our listeners from around the world live probably in very different situations, but we're gonna need to learn uh, to do this in order to invite uh, people into the faith uh, to follow Jesus. Part of what that looks like, I think, is welcoming people whose, whose, whose practices, whose belief systems are different, right? Mm -hmm. that, that look different. Um, yeah, so I wanna, be, I wanna be careful that we're not too quick to label some things as secular when they really are you know, spiritual seeking on, the, on behalf of some people as well. Well, absolutely. I mean, yes, I think the fundamental, everybody's seeking, I think. Uh, but I was just talking about our society. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not even saying secular is bad, but I'm, I'm saying what it, what it isn't, isn't, it isn't following Jesus. But let's go on to Ezekiel 2. I mean, which it, uh, I, I, I suspect Ezekiel 2 is here just because of that one line. I'm sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. Uh, and that's, so that's kind of all you get. You know, um, uh, God sends Ezekiel just like Jesus sent out the apostles. And there you go. Well, and I, I was going to say, you know, going back to Mark, and then I, I just wonder if there is a distinction here in verse 11, if any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you. So it's not just a, that, that hospitality here, that being sent out is, uh, it's not, it's not, oh, come in and have, you know, come in and have dinner, but there's like the, the hospitality of listening. Uh, and hearing what's being said, and is there a is there a openness or a welcomeness to that? Um, I wonder. Yeah, and I think that invites us to th consider ourselves not the ones sent out, maybe necessarily, but the ones sent to. That God has sent prophets to us, like Ezekiel, mm -hmm. and are we those who hear verse five or refuse to hear? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And right. I mean, it's a totally different posture for the sermon is to, to ask our communities um, whether or not we are open to the biblical word. Mm -hmm. And if that's a direction somebody wants to go, then I think it's important to ground it in some specific other places in prophets um, and not just, uh, not just in, you know, take Micah 6, 8, do justice, love kindness, walk intentionally with God. Um, but also in the hope, I mean, uh, the prophets, the prophets always move to hope and do we share the hope that they share, uh, the hope that believes that the agent who will determine the creation's future is actually the creator who still wants a relationship with it. I mean, this is one thing that makes, I think, not to jump totally back to Mark 6, but to keep this dialogue open, that makes that passage so interesting is you can read this and say it appears that Jesus has no power because there's no faith present in Nazareth, or Mark says in his hometown. And um, so Matthew cleans that up. Matthew, in, that, in, in the parallel version there, uh, changes that. Of course, in Luke, it's a really different story in a lot of ways. But he does still heal people when he's there. Like he still has a kind of prophetic agency, a kind of prophetic effect. You know, things happen. 
sends the disciples. Some people won't listen, but the disciples are still healing people, right? They're still anointing people with oil. They're still driving out demons. They're doing the work. And so the, the, the people who won't hear, I think that's in some ways reflected in Ezekiel too, right? They'll still know that a prophet was among them, that the, the point of the ministry, so to speak, isn't necessarily to get everybody on board to be convinced, but it's to demonstrate this, this inbreaking of a new kingdom, this inbreaking of a new thing, as if it's not really up to Jesus or the disciples or Ezekiel to worry about um, who responds positively and who doesn't, mm -hmm. right? Your job is to continue to demonstrate the reality and you'll leave it up to God to see who comes around. I mean, I think there's, you can read that cynically, but I think there's hope embedded in that as well. If you recognize that God is the one who's, mm -hmm. who's, who's behind the prophet, right? And is going to make the prophet's words actually mean something or do something or create something down the road. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? In terms totally. Of mm -hmm. I mean, I think, it, it, mm -hmm. well, there's also a vulnerability in it. Um, uh, there's not a, I think it, it casts a um, light of vulnerability and even dependence on that on that being sent that is not that is uh, that is then I for me is a, a corrective to kind of uh, conviction and persuasion <laughs> uh, but that there you know especially in the in the in the details of of that kind of dependence on hospitality so uh, I, yeah I, I there's a there's a way in which then the text point to, I would say, humility, uh, knowing where that where that power is coming from, humility, dependence, and vulnerability. That um, that for me casts a different kind of uh, tone or um, stance or ethos around around the mission, if you will. If you take the second half of verse four and verse five, I am sending to you them, and you shall say to them thus says the Lord God. And then it doesn't say what the rest of the message is, but you know, that is the so that's the so called messenger formula that the prophets deliver to, because they're messengers. And so the authority comes from the one sending the message, not the not actually the messenger. Uh, but then they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. I don't know how this connects, but throughout Ezekiel, um, and they shall know that I am the Lord God it's uh that's a constant refrain so it's the knowing there's a big part of it and i also connect it uh to jeremiah i mean uh who's a contemporary of ezekiel although slightly older but they know that jeremiah is a prophet uh mm -hmm. the kings throw him in jail they throw him down a well they they you know uh but they still know he's a prophet they don't want to listen to him but they know mm -hmm. but we really need to uh, move past the first couple of lessons because we are uh, already almost uh, to 19 minutes. Um, oh my I want to say one brief thing anyway about um, the uh, the Second Samuel reading. Uh, so um, this is really um, in this story you get David. David really becomes king a couple different times. It's, uh, you know, he has to establish his rule over Judah and then over the, the tribes of Israel. Um, and so this is really, I think, the second uh, uh, acknowledgement of his kingship that he's been anointed to all the way back in 1 Samuel 16. But all this, I mean, essentially this reading just... Um, advances the narrative it's not tremendously it's not a preachable story from david's life if you know what i mean is there is there something though in what the commentary points out rolf in terms of the distinctions of the kind of power that that are that david will exercise in terms of shepherd as opposed to power over of saul that there is that there is some sort of indication that in David is a kind of ruling or rulership king kingship that is um, that is held up as as a critical component of what that's going to look like for Israel. Well, um, 
I like what Amy Odin does. Uh, I don't really know that it actually ends up uh, being what David actually becomes. Well, that's true. I mean, that's the problem. <laughs> I know. You know yeah. There's a little problem with that. Uh, there, there's hope on the front end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, maybe that's it. That uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Uh, won't get, uh, I was just <clears throat> forget it, forget where I was going there. But uh, it turns out, I mean, um, David in the end uh, becomes, frankly, the way I read the Old Testament and the New Testament is Jesus actually is what David was supposed to be. Uh, David is remembered uh, in the Deuteronomistic history as the ideal king, uh, mostly because he's not Solomon or, and he's not like any of the Northern kings in terms of setting up um, temples to, to foreign gods. Uh, but I don't actually think in David's exercise of power that he's any kind of role model. And how would you work in Psalm 123 with every, anything we've talked about? I wouldn't. I would just preach right <laughs> on Psalm 123 uh, because uh, for, for one thing, uh, uh, verses um, two and three are, uh, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master and as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Um, so, I mean, one thing just to note here is that um, God is likened both to the master and the mistress. And we in our faith are uh, likened to the eyes of the male slaves and the female servant. Uh, and we look to God until God has mercy. Um, so I think that might just be mm -hmm. worth putting that right out there and then, uh, talk about what it like what it means to look to god for mercy when the world treats us with contempt which is the rest of the uh psalm it could be a great psalm sermon for uh for the fourth of july <laughs> uh -huh. i mean that it, you know when so yeah. much of you know how does the how does the church offer a, a different kind of view toward greatness or yeah our role in the world i mean i'm not I don't want to bash everybody who says God bless America, but when that's the predominant theme, right? When every politician has to end a major speech with God bless the United States of America, what does it mean here where the, where the, where the ask is for mercy as opposed to blessing? You know, what does it mm -hmm. mean? I get you're, you want to be blessed to be a blessing to others, but just to say, what, is it, what does it mean to, to ask for mercy? And why would no politician ever say, God have mercy on America? Cause that would mm -hmm. kill your poll numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, a, I could imagine a sermon that doesn't have to be nasty or anything like that, or, or isn't gonna get you in trouble with the congregation, but just offers an alternate way of, you know, mm -hmm. well, there's, there's a great, there's a great speech out there, right? What is, I'm gonna get the title wrong, right? What difference is the fourth? What is what does a slave think about the fourth of July? Or what's the difference? What difference does the fourth of July make to a slave? I mean, what does it mean to a Christian? Would be an interesting sermon topic. Mm -hmm. to yeah, explore. you're talking about. Um, it's. <laughs> I forgot. Is uh, I'll look it up. Hold on. I've got my. Um, that's never from, ad lib. Well, it's from before the Civil War. Um, mm -hmm. What Frederick, to the slave is the fourth of July? Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Douglass. Yeah, Frederick I, I Douglass. can't remember the last yeah. name. Yeah. From 1852. And by the way, that's because I'm old. I, I, I usually assign that reading, by the way, you know, in my prophets class. Um, it, it, if people don't know that great text from American history, uh, they should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, another great 4th of July text would be 2 Corinthians 12. And my handy dandy calendar church yeah. year calendar tells me this is the last reading from second Corinthians for a while. Yeah. But at least for this run. Yeah. Once again, context. <laughs> so important. People have to know that at the start of chapter 11, Paul says, just bear with me for a little bit. I'm going to talk like an idiot now. I'm going to talk and cray cray. <laughs> <Yeah>. And then he, <laughs> 
but it's actually, you know, we learn a lot about Paul in this passage, but it's, it's again, what's the mark of real spirituality? Mm -hmm. What's the mark of mature spirituality? What's the mark of Christian spirituality? Uh, Paul's going to say it's not about having all the visions or having all the deep insights. It's not about knowledge. Elsewhere, he'll say it's about love. But here he's like, you know, it's in this weakness that I encounter the cross of Christ. I don't seek out these kinds of experiences because true power comes in weakness. Mm -hmm. And to unpack that a bit for folks without it becoming abusive. Another, I like that, An another angle into it is um, just, just to, to, to note in verses eight and nine, uh, you know, he talks about the thorn in the flesh. And I know, Matt, you love it uh, when people equate that with um, him losing his sight. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, <laughs> but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, no. Dan Simonson in his book, uh, Where is God in My Praying? many years ago, uh, has a chapter about prayers in the Bible to which God said no. You know, that um, David prayed that his son might live. God said no. Moses prayed to enter the uh, promised land. God said no. Jesus, uh, Jesus said, I don't remember if Dan talks about this one, but Jesus asked that the cup would be passed from him. Um, and God said no. And, and obviously here, Paul, that um, if, if you've had the experience of praying to God and not having prayers answered, you're you're right at home with uh, some of the the greats of the faith, Moses, Paul, uh, um, Jesus, and I think that's just helpful to teach people because uh, some people only uh, hear the you know the things like uh, whatever two of you ask in my name, you know, and agree on, I'll do whatever you ask, you know, that part from John. And if that's all they know about biblical prayer, um, they might think there's something wrong with them that their prayers aren't answered. 